I want to consider the question, religion is irrelevant in deciding issues surrounding sexual behaviour. Of course, we could have written a question on sexual ethics as utilitarianism is the best approach surrounding sexual ethics, or we could have substituted any of our four theories, utilitarianism, situation ethics, Kantian ethics, natural law, in that question. I would revise all possibilities because this year this is the most likely applied issue to come up. The introductory paragraph should address the question, and there are two elements here, and both need to be narrowed down. What is meant by religion and what is meant by sexual ethics? For religion, we will of course take Christianity and particularly perhaps the interpretation given in natural law theory, because that is the official moral theology of the Roman Catholic Church, which we find in many papal encyclicals. That's the published letters of, from the Pope to the churches. And for issues, we might consider particularly three. Autonomy, the right of the individual to choose. Pleasure and the spiritual aspects of sex, such as senses, uh, the sense of self-worth and feelings of love. We could, of course, add a fourth, which is reproduction, and that is the one that historically has had most emphasis in the development of natural law theory, and also in how the Christians have interpreted the Old Testament, which seems to see women as a kind of property right. Now, we will need a thesis statement, such as, religion is irrelevant as it is human reason about our own self-identity, our own circumstances, and the general values of choice and respect for others, which are the most important issues. That's just an example. Of course, we could also focus on a specific moral issue, such as, is sex before marriage wrong? Sexual behaviour usually involves more than one person, and also has, therefore, social implications. And the Me Too movement we've seen in the last few years has elevated the principles of autonomy and respect, which are clearly strong moral values in themselves. For example, Kantian in Kantian ethics, the second formula, the formula of ends, states never treat someone just as a means to an end, but always also as an end in themselves. And that means with the sort of dignity and respect that with which we would like to be treated ourselves. So, as Professor Norman points out, the second formula of Kant is really saying we should universalise our shared humanity. Now there's nothing particularly Christian or exclusively religious about this second formula. It is a general moral principle, a principle says Kant of reason. Indeed, the application of natural law theory in Christian theology tends to argue for one human nature, heterosexual, as the norm, and for other human natures, such as homosexual, as deviations from it. And so Human I Vitae, 1968, describes the gay orientation as intrinsically disordered, disordered in its very nature. So gay sex is seen in Roman Catholic theology as against reason and against nature itself. God has designed us in this argument, to be a certain way, male and female, God created them in Genesis 1. If we take the Bible literally, Paul in Romans chapter 1 denounces those who engage in gay sex as subject to God's wrath, and he takes a very severe line on homosexual sex. God, says Paul, has abandoned these people to their lustful desires. 
Not only is this kind of homophobia a feature of Christianity and history, it is also a feature of the biblical account in Romans. So we have a choice. Either we don't take these passages literally, or we look to other places as our source of moral guidance. And that is my argument here, that we tend to look to other sources for moral guidance on sex. Now, one such source is utilitarian ethics. Here, consequences are assessed on a balance of pleasure over pain, happiness over min misery. So we get a kind of net valuation, happiness minus misery, based on the likely consequences of our decision. However, as Peter Vardy points out, the scales have shifted in recent years because of cures for disease, the introduction of contraception that is effective and free for everybody, and freely available rather for everybody, and social reforms and, re and changes in attitude. Um, and for example, we no longer see it as taboo to be a single parent family bringing up our, our own child or children. It's easier today to avoid the pain both of the implications of disease, the consequences of disease and of social disapproval. And therefore we can take responsibility in a new way for our own happiness. Utilitarian ethics elevates choice. John Stuart Mill talks about human beings being sovereign over their body and mind. But in emphasising pleasure alone, utilitarianism arguably devalues the more spiritual aspects of relationships. So what are these spiritual aspects? Love, a sense of self-worth and a sense of our own dignity. We are made, says the Bible, in God's image, a little lower than the angels, it says in the letter to the Hebrews. We are endued with reason and with self-worth. These are easily destroyed by sexual exploitation and indeed by an overemphasis on pleasure. We are not just pleasure machines and the paradox of pleasure is that if we are often that we are often much happier when we postpone pleasure so avoiding casual sexual relations for example and go for moral values such as commitment and respect. Again, the Me Too movement reminds us that it is too easy for sexual conduct to tip over into sexual exploitation. And here, a form of Kantian rationalism may serve us better. We have the principle of respect mentioned above, but Kant also argues we should universalise our behaviour in the formula of law. Can we create a general maxim principle which enshrines such universalizability about sexual conduct? Often these will be expressed negatively. Do not exploit another person sexually because you would not want to be so exploited yourself. Do not lie to your sexual partner because you don't want to be lied yourself to yourself about your sexual history, for example, or your love for another person or the fact even that you're not interested in them. These are arguably features of the Tinder age, the age of Tinder dating. Instead, act with care and integrity, always by mutual consent, and be honest in all your sexual behaviour. That's the way, says Kant, to, drip, to build the greatest good, both personally and socially. So, my thesis statement was saying that we don't need religion. Indeed, religion can sometimes work against the common good, as we find on issues of gay sex and the prevalence of homophobia, even in our society today. That is fanned by certain statements taken literally, for example, in Romans 1. Telling someone you love them with agape commitment, sacrificial love commitment, whilst all also saying that they are disordered, doesn't sound right, consistent or loving. And the age of reason requires more specific and general principles, I would argue. We find that in Kantian ethics, 
and we find it to some extent also, though less so perhaps in utilitarian ethics, both unite in arguing, however, that we have our own resources placing human autonomy and choice at the centre for deciding the best course of action in our sexual behaviour. We don't therefore require God or religion, although in reminding us of the spiritual dimensions of sex, religion clearly retains ethical value.